So this is uh, our eighth panel of our uh, Fest Schrift uh, celebration of Gordon Rouser's career. This panel is entitled China-US Trade Relationships, Agricultural Distortions and the Uruguay Round. And it will be moderated by Doug Irwin, the John French Professor of Economics at Dartmouth. Let me introduce for you uh, for Doug. He is the author of Clashing Over Commerce, A History of US Trade Policy, University of Chicago Press 2017, which was The Economist magazine, which as a closet economist I read every week, and Foreign Affairs magazine, which I also read when I get a chance, selected as one of their best books of the year. He worked on trade policy issues while on the staff of President Ronald Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors, and later worked in the International Finance Division at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System in Washington. Before joining Dartmouth, Irwin taught at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. The Hayek Prize was conceived and funded by the Manhattan Institute trustee Tom Smith to, rec to recognize the influence of F.A. Hayek and to encourage other scholars to follow his example. And uh, Doug's book, Clashing Over Commerce, has won that award. So Doug, take it away. Thank you. I have some pictures, so I'm going to uh, stand up here just to start out. First of all, it is a uh, great pleasure to be here uh, in joining and celebrating Gordon Rouser. He deserves all the honors he's been receiving. Um, tremendous multifaceted person. Um, and I guess this panel is to discuss the policy Gordon, the Washington Gordon, if you will. So uh, I had the great pleasure and the honor to work with Gordon for a year at the Council of Economic Advisors in the Reagan administration, 1986-87. Uh, I was not supposed to do that. I'm a trade person, not an ag person. But Gordon had someone assigned to him who turned out to be uh, rather incompetent. And I remember distinctly uh, that uh, he had uh, tasked this person to uh, uh, go talk to uh, D. Gale Johnson about some issue that uh, D. Gale could explain it all. Half an hour later, Gordon in his office receives a phone call from D. Gale, who's the nicest man ever, says, Gordon, don't you ever have that person call me again. <laughs> Uh, and so Gordon was looking around, so I was drafted to help Gordon uh, on various ag issues, and it was really to my great fortune. Uh, so I worked on trade and agriculture, and all the adjectives that uh, have described Gordon uh, were very much evident in that year. Incredibly high energy, vigorous intellectual engagement, uh, striving, always striving to do better and bring everyone around him up and, and force everyone to do better. And something which I think hasn't been emphasized enough here, fun. Uh, just the joy of doing economics, the joy of work. Uh, we had so many laughs, so many great times uh, during that year. And of course, the issues were amazing as well. This is the, uh, that we both joined in September of 86 when the Uruguay round was launched. Uh, the OECD was working on PSEs. Um, reform was in the air. Uh, uh, agriculture was really at the forefront of so many debates. So I just want to show you one picture from our CEA year there. And you can see with the, uh, Gordon there, the big arrow pointing to him. Uh, we had a lot of, uh, uh, this is in the Oval Office with Ronald Reagan there in the center. Um, we had a lot of illustrious economists who went on to do great things. Obviously, uh, I think this helped out Gordon in terms of his Washington presence. Came back here and did great things. The person right next to uh, Gordon on the left is uh, Rich Clarida, who is currently the vice chair of the Federal Reserve Board in Washington. Uh, the far left is Mike Musa, our sort of intellectual leader, who later became the director of research in the Economic Council at the International Monetary Fund for about a decade. And uh, so many others went on to do great, uh, great things. Now, the major work of the council is to uh, produce the economic report of the president. And uh, here is the agriculture chapter, which uh, I helped uh, Gordon with. And hearing Stan Johnson talk yesterday about uh, his three-volume dissertation put this in a new light for me because this, the first draft of this chapter was about as long as the entire report was supposed to be. So we spent weeks and weeks trying to uh, beat it down and condense it and uh, really make it sing, which in fact uh, we did do. Um, uh, and in fact, it turned out to be, I think, one of the, the key chapters for that year and even uh, uh, thereafter. Um, if you, uh, uh, I reread the chapter recently, which I hadn't done in many, many years. And what's remarkable about that chapter is how it doesn't pull any punches. It is really tough and uh, rigorous. 
and vigorous in terms of its identification of the costs to the U.S. and the world of agricultural distortions in trade uh, and production. Um, and it's, you know, usually the economic report of the president is a little bit, it's heavily vetted, it's, it's pro-administration, it's a little bit of a cheerleading type. This is a very hard-hitting uh, chapter, and that's uh, all due to Gordon. Uh, the fun part is that as we worked on this together, um, uh, we would uh, throw in insider jokes and uh, quips and puns and things that others wouldn't get. Now, a lot of this was left on the cutting room floor. I recall something about sugar and sweet and sour and this, uh, that and the other thing. But this the one thing made it. So I want to see if, you, if anyone here recognizes it. So I've highlighted this passage. It says, as a result, the cost of agricultural commodity policies that attempt to restrain production and enhance prices through land controls are, in short, toweringly expensive. Do you remember the reference? I do. OK. Does anyone? Now, now, no one seems to be laughing here, but we had tremendous chuckles over this because what this is focusing on is Senator John Tower, who was behind a lot of the, the land uh, uh, acreage set asides to uh, increase prices. And of course, uh, if you, you may not remember him, but he was very diminutive. He was very short. Uh, so that's why when we say here, in short, toweringly expensive, this is directly trying to get at John Tower, but uh, no one on Capitol Hill noticed it, but great insider joke there. Um, but here, here's another, some more evidence on the importance of this particular chapter. Uh, so after the report's released, um, uh, the chair, the, the council, and, and the members go to Capitol Hill. They testify before the Joint Economic Committee. Uh, and it's, it, it, they usually talk about macroeconomic developments. The, the chapters usually get ignored. But uh, during this time, there's one uh, senator uh, who signaled, you know, said, who wrote that agriculture chapter? Now, that's actually a bad sign if you're the chair, because you don't know if they hated it, you know, they're going to try to do something uh, uh, to hurt you. Uh, but instead, this president, this uh, senator says, let me say, I think it's a useful chapter and a very good reference material and rather concise, and I appreciate that. Now, the, the irony, of course, is they thought I was concise because if we had seen the first draft, that wouldn't have been the first word that comes to mind. Uh, but the published version was very concise, very hard hitting. Um, so we had a tremendous uh, time uh, during that year. Uh, I learned a tremendous amount uh, that expanded my knowledge away from just trade per se to, uh, into agriculture. And so we're here to uh, discuss at a more intellectual level uh, some of the issues that were an issue back then but are still issues today. China, Uruguay round, trade distortions, and we have a tremendous panel here to help us do that. I'll briefly introduce them. Uh, you know most of them already, and we'll go in order here. Uh, we have Hong Bin Li. Uh, uh, who's uh, the uh, James Ling Director of the China Program at the Stanford Center on Global Poverty and Development. Uh, next, we have Dan Sumner, who's the Frank Buck Distinguished Professor uh, at UC Davis in Agricultural Economics. Uh, uh, Dan, of course, was, uh, came the year right after we were there at CEA, so he uh, uh, probably remembers many of these things as well. And then Harry DeGorder, uh, the Charles, uh, who's at the Charles Dyson School of Applied Economics at Cornell University. One person who unfortunately couldn't be here is Kim Anderson uh, from Adelaide uh, due to uh, a health issue in the family, uh, and I do have a letter from him, which I think he sent to Gordon. If we have time at the end, I'll read some excerpts from that. But why don't we begin uh, uh, the panel? Thanks, Doc. So uh, this is the first time I meet Gordon. So how am I related to Gordon? I think maybe there are two reasons. Maybe so one is actually Scott was Scott Rosell was invited to give a talk, but he's traveling in China, so he is my colleague, also my advisor actually. So he urged me to come. He said, Gordon, you have to meet Gordon. He's an amazing person. So yeah. So this is my honor to be here. Uh, second reason is actually I uh, did get my uh, first degree from Ag Econ, actually, in China. So I graduated from China Agricultural University. And I was the last student admitted by FRI of Stanford, Food Research Institute. And after I arrived on campus of two weeks, and Stanford told me, your department is going to be shut down. <laughs> so I had no place to go. So at that time, I was told by my professor that I could come to Berkeley ARE department if I chose to come, actually. So thank you. I think Gordon was the dean at the time. Thank you for giving me uh, the opportunity. But in the end, I think Stanford uh, economists decided to adopt us. So we finished our PhD there. Uh, that's the story. So after my, I got my degree in 2001, so I taught in Hong Kong for six years and Tsinghua in Beijing, Tsinghua University in Beijing for about 10 years before returning to Stanford faculty. 
So all my research on China, so I'm not a trade expert. I'm also not an ag econ person anymore. So I'm going to talk about uh, China in general. So uh, I think my colleagues here will be talking about trade with China. Uh, so here. So this is the China's uh, GDP. You can see that there's uh, almost exponential growth in the past 40 years. Uh, so the big question is why? Why has been China growing so fast? There is a hypothesis which is becoming more and more popular here in this country, uh, which is state control is the reason behind China's success in the past 40 years. This is a very serious hypothesis, actually. When I was a student about 25, 20 years ago at Stanford, so there was a big debate about plant economy and market economy. Uh, as you know, the conclusion is, of course, market economy will win for sure. Uh, but now the question is raised again uh, uh, in, this, in this country. There are two related hypotheses about China. One is the China collapse hypothesis. This has been uh, hanging around for 30 years. China will, China's economy will collapse because, the, because of the state control. Another hypothesis is that China's state control makes China great. Why uh, is the word great? I'm going to show that both hypotheses are wrong. Uh, 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 they are wrong for different reasons, actually. Uh, one is for the assumption, the other is for fact. Uh, so what happened in China in the past 40 years? Let's go back a little bit to history, to 78. Back in 78, China had a perfectly state-controlled economy, which we called the planned economy, or the command economy, which means the government controls everything. Uh, everything. So I experienced that, uh, although I'm young, but I experienced everything during the plant economy. Uh, so at that time, the big question is that when uh, Deng Xiaoping and Hu Yaobang, they started the reform, a big question is that how to motivate those people who control the resources to use them to promote economic growth? So there are two uh, important papers in this area. Actually, one is by myself, the other is by uh, three other colleagues. Actually, all five authors were at Stanford at that time, and later, Ying Yiqian joined Berkeley, actually, joined Berkeley Econ. Uh, so there are two papers. One is saying that China's uh, leader decided to decentralize control rights. So gave the local officials, local governments, uh, the uh, control rights of the local economy. So we can make decisions on whatever we want of local economy. Second, they became the owners of the local economy, which means if you grow the economy uh, fast, you can have a larger uh, tax, more uh, fiscal revenue you can spend. Normally, these uh, officials, their friends and families are also doing business. So the economy grows fast, your family also benefits. So they become the residual uh, claim of the local economic growth. Uh, in a sense, in my paper with Lian, so, uh, we showed that the whole country is run like a big company. So each local government is like a, a like division of the company. So they compete against each other. Where we can grow the economy f uh, faster will be promoted to the center. So that means you'll, uh, you'll become owner of a bigger pie of the economy. So they are really motivated to grow the economy. Uh, by the way, both papers uh, uh, did not appear in top five journals. I think they tried. We didn't even didn't try. Uh, both papers were published in the same issue of Journal of Public Economics in 2005. And these two papers are the most cited papers in the whole field, actually. Uh, so my paper got over 2,000 citations in Google Scholar. Uh, so over the process, you can see that China's economy become more privatized. So the figure on the right is on the uh, share of labor employed by the state-owned sector and GDP growth. You can see that by now, less than 20% of the workers in the urban areas are employed by the state sector. If you uh, count also uh, labor in the, rural, in the countryside, I think over 90% of China's employment are with the private sector, not the state sector. On the left is about trade. Uh, so you, can China, you can see that China is more open over time with a larger share 
of trade as percent of GDP, although it started to de decline uh, 10 years ago. If we look at a, a shorter horizon from about like seven, eight years ago, China GDP started to decline. So on the left figure, I have the quarterly GDP growth uh, in the past, I think since 2011. Uh, the last quarter number just came out uh, last week, actually. China's growth rate was only 6% for last quarter. 6% is our last number, actually, for this country. But for China, it's the lowest in 30 years. Uh, on the right, I, I, I show that you can see that the share of private uh, uh, the private share in China's manufacture started to decline about the same time, and the share of state sector started to go up uh, in 2011. So something is happening since six, seven years ago. So why is China's growth declining? I can use the same model to explain this, because the model I just mentioned stopped working anymore. There are two reasons. One is so the, the center decided to re-centralize decision making from the local government to the center. So they formed a number of committees to make all the economic and also other decisions. Second, because of anti-corruption movement, so local officials cannot enjoy a share from local growth. They cannot benefit from it because their families and friends are banned from doing business they also cannot make a lot of decisions about the local economy. Uh, this will cause an issue because these people are still controlling other resources. They are controlling finance, land, all the important factors, uh, all the inputs. Uh, so when they have no incentive to use these inputs, economic growth will slow down. Uh, I'm not saying good or bad, this is uh, all positive uh, studies. So what I have shown is that the hypothesis that state control is the reason behind China's success was not true. It's the opposite. Growth happened in China because of the relaxation of state control. And re-centralizing state control only slowed down the economy. Uh, I'm not saying this model is perfect. Uh, this model has a lot of issues, actually. The biggest issue is, uh, think about this, the local officials are playing the role of entrepreneurs. They care about economic growth only. So they didn't care about other things like pollution, education, inequality. So there's a huge social cost with this kind of model. Normally, governments should uh, work uh, only provide public goods. But in China, the governments are providing private goods. They are not doing their job of providing public goods uh, in the past. Uh, there are many issues. This is a paper of mine. Uh, so in PNS, we show that pollution uh, shortened the life expectancy of uh, Chinese by five years. Uh, this is another paper, actually, this is with Scott. We show that uh, the education inequality is so huge that uh, the uh, admission rate to top schools in China, in the urban areas, is 100 times of the rate in rural areas. There's also anxiety of China model because uh, the model of government doing business is different from the model in other countries, especially here in the US, uh, it's all uh, private companies. Uh, so people complain about competing with a state, uh, uh, state controlled company, a state controlled uh, economy, where they have the monopoly power, they have soft budget, they don't care about profit profitability, they only care about growth. They even don't care about the rules and laws, but they are above the rules and laws in China. Uh, there's also uh, behavior of corruption, which could be contagious. Uh, so this will re receive a lot of resistance from outside the world, as you can see today. Uh, so if you see China's model, so I'm gonna finish this last one. Uh, uh, China has uh, basically uh, experienced two economic models in the past 70 years. The first uh, 30 years is the planned economy, so which didn't uh, do very well. The second is called basically state-controlled economic growth. It's so-called the reform period. 
Now this model is not uh, functioning very well as well. So there are only three choices uh, China can uh, uh, choose one of those. Uh, I think uh, the first two are not doing well. The only option that is really viable for China is the market economy. But uh, I'm just not sure when this will happen, but I think that's the only uh, possible option. Uh, I'm going to stop here. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Dan Sumner. So uh, I really like uh, Doug's pictures of the Oval Office and the like. That, that brought back memories. And so when, when I thought about structuring what I was going to say about trade policy, I, I, I thought back to, to those days. And in fact, um, the, again, uh, we've got trade policy turmoil as headline news, particularly disputes with China. Uh, uh, people are talking about uh, uh, literally on the street. Uh, those of us, that, and farm policy is certainly a big uh, part of that uh, in those disputes. Uh, I want to think about uh, where s the institutions, and, and I, I want to focus on institutions for a few minutes, similar to the panel that we had a few minutes ago. Because I think, and, and in fact, much like some of the discussion last night, at, uh, at the chancellor's house, the idea of uh, building, creating, reconstructing institutions to, to solve problems. And I think that's fundamental. And so when, when Doug was talking about the Uruguay round and talking about uh, OECD work on, on measuring uh, subsidy levels and uh, uh, this 300 page chapter in the, uh, uh, in the Council of Economic uh, uh, in the report of, economic report of the president that it was, of course, condensed down to somewhat less than that. Uh, the, the, uh, economists naturally gravitate toward, towards thinking about specific policies and evaluating particular policies, and we've done that with respect to China occasionally. Uh, I want to I mention a couple of those, but again, I'm going to focus on the institutions. When I got to the CEA uh, a year after these guys left, uh, the first policy I dealt with, uh, interestingly enough, was uh, an effort to put a, a block on beef imports, particularly from Australia and New Zealand. Um, Gordon re may remember a paper with John Freebairn about uh, uh, beef import restraints. Uh, as soon as he left town, Reagan was faced with a choice, do I put these uh, restraints on? I was at the CEA, of course, I had this elaborate argument for why that was silly policy. It was silly policy. Uh, I, because I was so sophisticated politically, I went to all the other agencies in the Trade Policy Review Group and had them all agree, except, of course, USDA, which I, you couldn't bring around to opening trade for agriculture. And Friday afternoon, I was so pleased I'd, I had it all nailed. Uh, you know how this story goes. On Sunday, the president announced that he was applying these trade restraints. And in fact, every, every bit of work I'd done was a total failure. And I knew nothing about politics, actually. And the president had talked to the senator from Montana who said, yeah, I'll vote for that trade bill or that employment bill or what, uh, I think it was a tax reform. But you got to give me uh, trade restraints on beef from Australia. And sure enough, and it might have been a great decision but it uh, was my first lesson of what an idiot I was when it came to trying to do politics. And so I, I quit doing politics at that stage. And, and, but but that, uh, the idea of thinking through how institutions affect policy. I, and one of the very important things there was that those of us that were in Washington at the time, and really everybody in the country, nobody else other than me, a notice this trade restraint on beef. Me and the senator from Montana were probably the only two people who really cared about it. Uh, but everybody knew that that was counter to the thrust of the administration. And where we are now is, of course, just the opposite, where we have administration where if they do allow some trade, that's sort of not consistent with the administration's policy. And we have an administration that's, in a sense, anti-trade more broadly, and I think that is a very serious problem in dealing with things like China, because I agree, dealing with China uh, uh, when it comes to global policy is, is crucially important, and those of us uh, and, and people that thought about the WTO back in the 1980s and 90s uh, and, 
and then in 2001 when China joined, hadn't really thought through how do you deal with a country that institutionally isn't really set up to deal with these rules. And so that idea of institution building in the Uruguay round, creating something called the World Trade Organization, I think uh, ended up being more important probably than the specific trade policy changes that were incorporated into the Uruguay round agreement. Part of that agreement was to bring agriculture into the framework of the GATT and into this World Trade Organization. And here's where I want to say something nice. Economists don't usually spend their time praising lawyers and, and global bureaucrats. But I want to praise lawyers and global bureaucrats. I think the panel process for litigation of dispute settlement at the WTO, the creation of an appellate body at the WTO, was a wonderful institution. And in fact, even uh, this idea that you move the process towards opening markets by allowing withdrawals of concessions in the name of opening markets is, is incredibly positive uh, contribution. Even though, and, and it's because it's, an institu it's a global institution that doesn't have people with blue helmets. It, you, you can't invade some country in the guise of the WTO. You can do it for the United Nations. You can blow up somebody's embassy in, in the guise of the, of the United Nations. The WTO doesn't, doesn't do that, and it allows people to withdraw concessions instead as a form of retaliation. But it's a structured retaliation that has global sanction, and I think that's crucially important. And the frustration for many of us is that the United States is, in a sense, abandoned or weakened that institution, particularly in dealing with China, when you could have had a global consensus to put what could have been, I think, probably effective uh, uh, pressure on China. Because of what we've just heard, we have institutions in China that gain from growth, and if you threaten that growth, you can, you can do so. And I think we'd be, the, the world had been a much more effective place in, in threatening growth in China if it would have been done in a unilateral way. Uh, I also want to say that the WT institutions has encouraged practical economics, practical agricultural economics. In fact, some of the best work I've seen in practical agricultural economics has been presented to panels at the WTO. I'm thinking of some work that a Globe, Joe Glauber did actually on the other side of the table from me, but, but really good work uh, presented uh, measuring the effectiveness and, and, and uh, a, a measure of support of U.S. farm programs in the context of option values. This is related to some work that Bruce Gardner and others have done, had done years before, but applying that in this case to, to U.S. policy and therefore the effects that it might have globally, uh, was really innovative and interesting work that, would, that panels at the WTO evaluated effectively. I think also of some work that Sebastian Pugliat, a student of mine, uh, did in the context of labeling policies in Mexican exports of cattle. Uh, and uh, the WTO, both through its, its adjudication panels and its, its uh, appellate body, I think has been remarkably effective in evaluating economics. Of course, it makes mistakes. I mean, lawyers and bureaucrats make mistakes in evaluating economics. We expect that. M my sense is they do a much better job than, for example, the US Supreme Court does in evaluating economic arguments often, even though I, uh, uh, my favorite free trade agreement in the world is the US Constitution. If you think about the Commerce Clause and what we established uh, after the Articles of Confederation in the US Constitution to create a free trade zone, uh, I, it, and it suggests that the WTO in that sense is, a, is an American-style institution, which I think is something that's lost on the current administration, for example, that the adjudication that's done it, it looks like the, the, uh, a US system. So. Um, uh, and I think that's some of the most dangerous things we're doing now in trade policy, in current trade politics, I should say, is the refusal to use these uh, uh, in, uh, uh, international institutions. And the little inside uh, concern there is the appellate body of the WTO itself is now down to, I think, three members or four anyway. They're right on the cusp of not being able 
to, to continue adjudicating trade cases. It would be as though we had a Supreme Court that, that was down to four members or something and you couldn't no longer uh, appeal things through the US judicial system. So I think we're right on, uh, it's, it's very dangerous times and it's even more dangerous when it comes to international trade because it, it doesn't look like, at least the current presidential elections, doesn't look like no matter who would win this, we solve that problem because of course uh, there's a tradition on the left of being anti-trade and now we have this tradition on the other side being anti-trade. And so it is uh, uh, frustrating times for trade economists. And that's especially why I liked thinking about uh, the 1980s and 1990s when we were building these institutions. And I think they were successful for a long time. Uh, I would like to think we could get back uh, to, to uh, using these institutions uh, uh, for good economics. And with that, Harry, over to you. Thank you. Well, I'm Harry DeGorder, and uh, I met Gordon with Stan Johnson 42 years ago in Ottawa. Uh, Gordon was an expert econometrician, statistical consultant, and I was forecasting prices. And um, he and I speculated in the futures markets together. We hit it off. He encouraged me to come to Berkeley. Uh, I'm glad I came to do a PhD, and we became friends. I therefore, over the years, knew his children when they were teenagers or even younger, um, Sloan, Stephanie, and Paige. Um, and we've kept up over the 40 years. And Gordon puts a lot of priority on his family. And he today talks about his grandchildren. And he's going to have a great grandchild whose grandmother, uh, grandparents are Canadian, and they know exactly where I live. <laughs> the farm, two miles exactly where my farm where I grew up. So Canada, Ottawa, the family. Uh, Gordon always uh, emphasized family. His devoted wife, Wendy, is here. And I had a great chance to catch up with her last night. And so it's great to see you, Wendy, here uh, at this very special occasion. So there's a lot of history. Gordon, his family. It's a very emotional time for me. Um, Gordon has been a phenomenal mentor. Yesterday was unbelievable. I was awestruck, but not surprised. Um, I can't match it. But we've done, so I'm not going to try. Um, I have written a paper for the Feshgrift on one topic. And I just wrote the paper. And then I just brought Gordon in. One narrow topic. David, are you listening? Okay. And I just, <laughs> and I just brought Gordon in. And it was, I was just struck by how it was so easy to just bring him in. And every, all the superlatives that were said yesterday, uh, not all, but some of them, <laughs> I, not, but it's just you know, unbelievable. Uh, the superlatives were exactly uh, correct. Um, so I guess the last thing I want to say personally is yesterday they talked about undergraduate and how Berkeley gives value added to the undergraduates, first generation students and stuff. But I just want to tell you that not all PhD students are whiz kids coming in. And Gordon and Berkeley, and I appreciate that, did a lot of public good and value added for me. And I appreciate that to this day. OK, so now I'm supposed to talk about China, US trade relationships, agriculture, distortions, and Uruguay round. I have three stories, but I think I'll just stick to one. And I don't even know it's going to be a good story. Uh, but I think, I'm not sure in this presidential, uh, what do you call it? The presidential report of the economic president, economic, economic report. report of the president, uh, Gordon recommended decoupled subsidies. Is that correct? Buyouts. And for those of you who don't know what decoupled is, I know it's a very strange term that economists, economists are weird people. Uh, but it means that you get a subsidy, but it's unconditional. You don't have to produce to get the subsidy. And Gordon recommended that. And he recommended it more specifically, you know, a cash buyout. So uh, anybody that's engaged in farming gets it, and then you forget about it forever. Um, 
And there's lots of benefits of that. There's transparency, you can reduce trade distortions and all the silly things about paying farmers to produce and not to produce. You can uh, obtain farm income goals uh, simultaneously. Uh, you can target regions and farm sizes and what have you. But the problem is, as Gordon uh, recognized, that decoupling experience is problematic in both the design of their programs and their implementations. But the United States did implement decoupled in the 1996 Farm Bill. And it worked for about two years and the United States backtracked. And the reason why they backtracked is, well, we all have our theories. One theory is the enforcement and commitment uh, problems by politicians for promises that they can't keep, all right? Contracts uh, and explicit promises by the state are unenforceable because they are the state and they make their own contracts. Um, and likewise, for individuals, uh, in, uh, individual voters can't commit to the next politician as well. And so in the United States example, it didn't work. But then, there was a movement to um, uh, push this concept when Mexico wanted to join NAFTA. And when Mexico wanted to join NAFTA in the early, uh, or create NAFTA, join the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, the uh, United States demanded that they change their import barriers and their silly, uh, their, their, not silly, price supports for farmers and subsidies for consumers and thought that was distorting world markets. And the dominant political party in Mexico had these millions of maize farmers as their uh, base political support, so they had to do something. And so the option was have decoupled payments and base it on historical acreage, okay? Uh, and when this was recommended to the cabinet ministers, to De Del Gortari's brother was there, and all the cabinet ministers have PhDs from Harvard and what have you. I don't know if you noticed that when you go to developing country, the cabinet ministers are kind of smart. Um, and then they said, well, how are we gonna have these decoupled payments? And I said, well, you just base it on what they produce. And they said, they don't have land titles. And then I said, oh no, first they said, how are you gonna get the money to them? I said, just mail them a check in the mail. They don't have mailboxes. They don't have land titles. You don't even know what they produced. And then they said, you're from Canada. You don't know anything about what's going on in developing countries. And, and then they said, you're from Berkeley and they're not very applied. Uh, PhD program, you, go, oh, you guys are a little bit more theoretical and stuff. And um, they kind of laughed at me. But, but, <laughs> but what happened? We had the biggest land title registration program in the history of mankind, and I'm, you, you know more than me. Uh, they got mailboxes. They implemented this decoupled program. They had to, they had to have a transition. It was a little bit of a pert. Uh, past, sorry, but it meant to be transitional. I didn't even keep up how this, it was uh, implemented by a World Bank uh, structural adjustment program. Um, and I won't give you too many details, um, but uh, they had a minimum payment of one hectare, 1.9 farmers uh, had less than one hectare, so they got a minimum payment, so that was better. It gave income distribution improved. There was a maximum of 100 hectares. We had, as I said, we had uh, the farmers, the small farmers in the mountains didn't benefit from the f trade barriers in the first place because they weren't integrated with the market. Um, and, but the big picture, I know this is a lot of detail, the big picture is an example, and Doug, you're, you're listening now. <clears throat> if you read his books, which my students are required to read, is that um, trade agreements give pressure for policy control and they, they allow for credible policy reforms so that uh, investment takes place and the productivity improves. And this is an example uh, of one of those. And Danny Roderick, I uh, teach in class, says you've got to have institutions and governance first and then you have market economies. But Gordon Rouser would love, and Gordon Rouser would get this 
this, this nuance that, well, maybe we'll have a trade agreement, make a trade agreement go first, which looks like uh, the cart before the horse, but then uh, trade policy then forces institutional change. So it's the inverse of what Danny Roderick always argued, and Gordon would get that. Gordon would see that, and it's kind of simultaneous, actually. It's not really a re inverse of Danny Roderick. Um, so that's, that's the one story that I want to talk about, Gordon, uh, and, um, and institutional change, and the Council of Economic Report, and agriculture extortions, and, uh, uh, and, and trade reform. But I, 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 uh, China, China's in the title. I'm not going to speak anymore. Uh, but China's in the title. And, uh, and China fits into the big picture also, uh, they wanted to join the WTO. Why did they want to join the WTO? Because they wanted to have uh, secure investment. They didn't want Congress to cut them off to the MFN status they had, and they really wanted to get in for good reasons. And then Canada, EU and the United States, but also Canada started imposing things on what they had to change their domestic uh, governance of the economy. And they did a lot, not as much as I guess we'd like to, given the current situation. But I can remember pri uh, US investment in China was protected more than a Chinese investment in China. Uh, and again, another example of how trade, the pressure of a trade policy forces domestic reform, not domestic reform first, then let's do it, trade agreement and policy. And so I'm going to end with a, a, a little short. 22nd story here. I was in Shanghai earlier this year, and I teach this in my globalization class, and it was, it was nice to see that. I went to the tallest building in the world. It's now the second tallest building in the world. And when you're waiting in line, they have on the wall a, a, like a huge, long, narrow timeline of the Shanghai uh, skyline. Timeline of skyline, OK. And it starts in the 1800s. And so you're watching and you see a boat come in here and there's a building and a warehouse over there and then it goes 1900 and then it speeds up a little bit and then it gets to 1992. Okay, 80s, couple of buildings. Then 1992, see some buildings? Some buildings in Shanghai. And then, all of a sudden, 2000, this goes whoosh. From 2000 to 2012, it just goes and then 2012, and now it's sort of, I think, right to your, your thing. What happened in 2000? They joined the WTO. The investment was there. And it's just unbelievable to see that video. Probably got nothing to do with what really happened, but it's a nice story for my students. Um, maybe you can tell me if it's, it's legitimate or not. Okay, I'll, I'll end there. <laughs> So I'm reminded, uh, one of the themes here has been uh, how do you bring about policy change uh, and the role of compensation. So that, that's one thing came up. And I remember a debate that you had with Mike Moose in the hallway once where Gordon was imploring him, saying, you know, we have to compensate farmers to bring this uh, change about. and it'll, it'll help accelerate uh, movement in the right direction. And uh, Mike's response was, screw them. Um, and in some sense, they're both right. So if you have political power, maybe you want to just push right through. You don't need to, the compensation. But Gordon's also right in the sense that uh, you just build a greater resistance if you don't have that compensation and sort of that, that balance. Uh, so we have some time for uh, Q&A. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, please raise your hand. There are some roving mics and sort of some over here. Um, yeah, so this is for uh, Hong Bin and uh, well, for, for, for the panel. And it's, it's, a, it's a, a normative question. So what should be done to the state-owned enterprises in China uh, so, so that they are not going to become such a roadblock to the economy uh, in the sense that, you know, it's not, I'm not talking about privatization. You know, equal access to finance, uh, removal of monopoly power, uh, but also fundamentally, what are the, you know, the structural changes and institutional changes that are needed to get this done? Thank you. So why don't we collect a few, uh, and then we'll, we'll answer them, and we'll see if we have time for more. Yeah. Um, I'm Brian Wright. I, I started teaching agricultural policy in the 1970s, and uh, one of the big issues right then was the common agricultural policy of the European Union. And spend quite a lot of time talking to students about the, the costs and the waste and the inefficiency of the 
common agricultural policy. Uh, it was pretty hard to estimate how much that was. And one day a student asked me, he said, what do you think, you know, of the agricultural policy of Europe in general? And I said, well, it's a very wasteful policy. It's interfering with trade. It's interfering with comparative advantage. But I said, if that policy has prevented a cycle in Europe that's been going on since at least the late 19th century, but look, look at 1914, you had England and other countries uniting to stop the rise of Germany, basically, as a competitor. 1939, you have the same thing happening again. Germany didn't get beaten down, fighting again, and now you've got Japan also not rising, an attempt to maybe prevent Japan coming on the scene, and maybe also Russia from Germany's point of view. After that, you had an unprecedented peace in Europe for half a century, and I, th and I said, if the common agricultural policy was one of the instruments for getting that peace, then it was a real bargain. And I think that's worth listening to now because we've got people in Washington who are talking about preventing the rise of China in the world scene. They put, they put it in different words, but that's what they're talking about, as if you can do that. And then some people recently in the last six months, New York Times have been talking about anticipating the next war with China. And wars and trade are two things which can be two instruments. And I think trade agreements are a better instrument than wars, even if the trade agreements are inefficient, if they prevent wars. You know, wars are really inefficient and they're also ineffective in stopping large countries with dynamic economies from taking their place on the world scene. I think America better get used to that before it becomes a disaster. But I think that big picture is really important for discussing trade policy. So I also have two questions for Hong Bin. Uh, so, of course, there are many shades of, a, of market economies, right? Um, if you could advise the Chinese government, what would be your roadmap towards some, somehow a, a market economy? And then the second question is, how would, I mean, how, how does a market economy work in a one-party state? Is that possible? I don't know. I'm just, just wondering. There's another question over here. Thank you very much. It's, it's really timely, right, given the conversation, given what we see in the headlines every day. And the public has a jaundiced view given the high-level sound bites we all hear as it relates to the current trade dispute with China. Set aside the forced intellectual property transfer issue. What are the real issues from a structural standpoint, right, that the deputies and others are trying to work through that are, that are most critical at where we are in the trade relationship today between the U.S. and China? One, one question here and then we'll get some answers from the panel or some responses anyway. Okay, since this panel is uh, talking about the uh, China-U.S. trade, so I have a question. Um, uh, can you estimate or forecast uh, when will the trade war between U.S. and China will end? Or can you uh, analyze um, the future developer trend on this? Thank you. Okay, so we have a number of questions there. State-owned enterprises, common agricultural policy as a social peace mechanism, possibly, um, the roadmap to a market economy in China, and uh, other questions on China. So why don't we just, we'll go down the row and see what we have to say on those. I think that all the questions on China, I mean, SOEs, uh, market economy, our trade wall, this is all related, actually. The same question, basically. Uh, to me, it's the same question. Uh, I think fundamentally, uh, there are two things between U.S. and China. One is the competition, a rivalry between two big economies. So only two, uh, uh, one rising power, one uh, incumbent power, there might be conflict, economic conflict, and all kinds of conflicts. Uh, and second, I think even uh, more uh, fundamentally, uh, there are two different value systems. I'm not saying right or wrong. So one uh, believes in market economy, the other, some believe in market economy, some believe in a state-controlled economy. 
So the values are different. So uh, in the end, uh, whether China become another uh, uh, like country like the US, that's a big question. I, I don't know when it's going to happen. Uh, before that happens, I think trade war won't end. It will, it will go on forever. So until the two countries become similar or they find a way to accommodate each other, uh, which I think is, is pretty difficult, actually. Uh, uh, I think fundamentally, uh, uh, if I could advise uh, uh, the government, I think they just accept all the proposals by the US trade negotiators. Everything is good for China. So all the reforms. So get rid of subsidies. So actually, one of my colleagues showed that subsidies does not help innovation. It hurts innovation. Because once you have subsidies, firms will seek to spend more time on rent seeking, not innovation itself. Uh, so SOEs should compete with other firms on a level field. You can have state-owned firm. Now let them compete with domestic private firms, with foreign firms. Let them compete, right? Uh, you shouldn't give them unlimited subsidies or loans, right? They, no, no company can compete with a company that doesn't care about profitability, right? So that's the issue. Uh, I think uh, uh, all the proposals from the US side is good for China. That's also, I also wonder, does the US administration want a stronger China or weaker China? Because they, what they propose is really helping China. I think uh, fundamentally, uh, I think this is also in, I think Vice President Pence's speech yesterday, he just gave a talk. Uh, I think uh, the tone is softener. I think it's getting better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, trade war will end on July 14th, 2020. That's the steel day, mark it down. That's when it's over. Uh, more seriously, uh, uh, I'm not going to deal with uh, state-owned enterprises directly. That's, that's not my deal. Uh, Brian raised issues about uh, uh, maybe uh, the common agricultural policy uh, was a, was a uh, helped the cause of peace. And certainly, if that were true, that would be great. And I think there is a legitimate argument to say the, European, the creation of the common market in the European Union and maybe massive subsidies to farmers was re a requirement of that. I don't know enough European history and uh, the man I know who could tell us the answer to that, Tim Josling, can't do it anymore. Uh, and I'm not going to try to replace uh, 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 Tim's insights on that. What I will say is that not every uh, institution that helps build peace has to be protectionist. Or, or has to be a matter of subsidy. And I'm going to go back to the WTO because I think it de is, is a way to think about this China problem and this trade war issue. If, if, if uh, imagine a case where uh, we might have uh, been a very aggressive, we meaning the rest of the world, been aggressive about dealing with China in the context of not uh, saying what one, one part of China does with, re with respect to the other part of China, that is internal policy. Uh, but with respect to how uh, Chinese policy spills over in the rest of the world, and I'll think about agriculture for a second in that context, uh, if we would have used the WTO thoroughly to deal with intellectual property issues, to deal with uh, 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 government investment issues, uh, I think there could have been remarkable success. And I'll give you two specific examples. The U.S. challenged uh, China farm subsidies in a WTO case that was filed three or four years ago. Uh, China lost that case uh, just this year, and, and they're going to deal with it. In fact, I know the inside a bit because I was uh, spent a little time talking to the lawyers who were defending China. And, and like good lawyers, they said, gee, the facts aren't on our side. Turns out the law is not on our side. So we'll throw up a bunch of stuff, you know? And, and, and they did that. And in fact, a year and a half ago, I was over talking to their clients uh, at the Minister of whatever it is, Foreign Affairs or Trade or something, uh, on this issue. And they knew they were going to lose. And the question was, what sort of deal could they cut in the context of dispute settlement in the WTO to move that through? And of course, the first thing you do is appeal everything. And that's going to go on for a while. But it's a purely legal process. And I can fully see the Chinese government 
a seed exceeding to whatever the WTO agrees to. And in fact, there's a case, and this is consistent with what Harry's saying, these are dumb policies to start with and they know this, and this allows Beijing to say, okay, we're not gonna do that policy anymore uh, in order to keep some peace in the world. The other case I wanna mention is not agriculture at all, but the Airbus case. And there you have a US, in this case a particular company, but the United States exporters competing with a state-owned enterprise, essentially Airbus, and the WT, and some really excellent, I mean, some of the world's best economists have worked on the Airbus Boeing case it, it, uh, 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 and, and doing very good economics. And I'm not gonna say who was right or wrong in terms of adjudicating that case. It's been going on for a decade or more, but, but I, I have no doubt that the European Union and the United States will come to a meeting in the minds about that. Meanwhile, by the way, the California olive industry is very happy because Spanish olives are on their re retaliation list. And so this, this retaliation uh, threat uh, uh, process is going on, but that puts enough pressure on European Union politicians so at some stage they'll come to some agreement there. And we could have done that in the context of China, and we may not, it, and, and, and maybe it's a, a shooting war we could have diverted, but at the very least we could have diverted, uh, Brian, a trade war by using institutions. And, and in the case of Europe, that what you raised, it was the common agricultural policy as a part of the Euro European Union, which generally was a free trade agreement. And so what I'm gonna argue is using free trade agreements and using inst global institutions. And I, I give the date July 14th, 2020, thinking um, that maybe by then we'll begin to use the institutions we have. Uh, more likely it might be July 14th, 2027. Uh, but uh, but I, I, I'm an optimistic guy, so there you go. Well, you've left me any time. Yeah. Okay, I, I'm... 11 seconds. I'd like to say, I like to treat all things, but I'll just tell you one little uh, in terms of Brian Wright. Uh, I'm no Tim Jostling, but uh, the United States asked for the waivers in the gap for agriculture, and they're the ones that gave the opportunity for the common agricultural policy to happen in the first place. And the guy that designed the common agricultural policy, Manchalt, was, the, uh, was in the Dutch underground during the Second World War with my dad. And my dad's a free trader. And Manchalt is kind of a free trader too, but he designed the common agricultural policy, 20 seconds, and when the Dillon Round came around, in 1962, where the United States wanted to uh, uh, reduce the uh, subsidies, made a turnaround, a face turnaround by the early 1960s, Manchalt still d uh, designed a program uh, proposal, a montant de soutien, which restricted the maximum tariff to be 100% in the common agricultural policy, and the United States turned it down because they wanted more. And the tariffs from 1962 to uh, 1990 were 200 to 300 uh, percent, you know, all the major commodities. So we could have done something a lot better than what we did. Uh, and the U.S. gave the opening for the common agriculture. But I'll stop there because this is. We're going to say oh, one thing. Sure. Last, I want to give him connection, though. I like family. <laughs> uh, for various reasons that I can't, we don't have time to get into, I'm uh, rather pessimistic about a rapprochement between the U.S. and China. I have an article in Foreign Affairs this summer that uh, goes into some of the reasons, but it gets to what you were saying is that there's this fundamental conflict. The, the whole GATT WTO system is predicated on having a market economy, and China, which is now moving back away from that under President Xi, I think just uh, makes it much more difficult uh, to, uh, for the two countries to get together. But that said, uh, what this administration has done is not just uh, start a trade war against um, China, but against many of our allies. And what I want to read is just a brief paragraph from President Ronald Reagan in November of 1988, when uh, Dan was there, uh, and he said this, which I think is incredibly uh, noteworthy uh, in light of uh, today's events, or, or, or what we're seeing today is what the president said, Today's, uh, prote today protectionism is being used by some American politicians as a cheap form of nationalism. Our peaceful trading partners are not our enemies, they are our allies. We should be uh, where the demagogues who are ready to declare a trade war against our friends, weakening our economy, our national security, and the entire free world, all while cynically waving the American flag. 
The expansion of the international economy is not a foreign invasion. It is an American triumph, and we are work, uh, one we worked hard to achieve, and something central to our vision of a peaceful and prosperous world of freedom. With that, I uh, thank the panel for uh, their insightful contributions. <laughs>